Um, the first talk today, I am very pleased to uh, to introduce Dr. Brett Blau, who's an associate professor and extension specialist in the Department of Entomology at the University of Georgia and with Clemson University. And his research and extension focuses on peach tree pest management, including both insecticide product trials, as well as understanding insect biology and ecology in order to optimize sustainable integrated pest management practices. I'm really looking forward to this talk. And so with that, if you wanna get started, Brett, you can go ahead and get your screen share up. All right, is that showing up? That looks great. Excellent. Well, great. Well, thank you very much for the invite, Janet and Mike. This, this is a, a really great opportunity for me uh, to come and talk to you all about some of uh, the work that we've been doing in the Southeast. Um, but I think it's very uh, applicable to, uh, the, to the Northeast and New York. Uh, unfortunately, Petrie Boar and Lesser, lesser Petrie Boar are uh, an East Coast problem for all of us. Um, but I want to talk about a, a tool, uh, mating disruption, that is actually qu quite effective at managing both the lesser petri boar and petri boar. So got a lot to say, so let's just get into it. All right, so as you uh, probably have heard, chlorpyrifos has been banned uh, as of March 2022. Uh, uh, all tolerances were, were revoked for food products. Um, so anything uh, like peaches that produce an edible crop, we are no longer allowed to use chlorpyrifos. However, for non-bearing trees, uh, there is a slight loophole here where we can use a chlorpyrifos on trees that will not bear fruit within one year. So young, young trees are still um, allowed this chlorpyrifos use. However, uh, a lot of the companies are stopping their production of chlorpyrifos, so it, it's that's uh, really not going to be something we can we can continue to use unless you have um, existing stock. So um, if you've used chlorpyrifos in the past, this is most likely going to mean your your management practices are going to have to change. And uh, one of our key pests, uh, let, which is why we're talking about this today, are the borers. Um, and so the main focus of my presentation is going to be about mating disruption and how we can use it and how it is actually a really effective practice. And then I'm going to end just with a brief uh, few slides on entomopathogenic nematodes, because mating disruption is, is really effective, but it's not gonna work for all situations. And entomopathogenic, entomopathogenic nematodes are an alternative process or practice that, that might work. All right, so uh, let's talk about this boar complex. There's two different boars. Uh, there's the peach tree boar, which is also known as the greater peach tree boar um, up in the, the Northeast. I know it's very common to call it the greater peach tree boar. However, um, the Entomological Society of America says that the actual common name is just peach tree boar. Uh, so that makes it really confusing. Uh, but so throughout this talk, I'll probably just call it the peach tree boar, um, but know that that's also known as the greater peach tree boar. All right, so the, the, the peach tree boar, um, is a clear ring moth. The, the females um, actually look a little bit different than the males. Uh, there's a sexual dimorphism here where the females have orange bands on the abdomen, whereas the males actually look more like wasps, uh, where they have the bl uh, black or almost steel blue with these yellow bands, and they have that more distinctive clear wings there. Um, both of them are considered uh, wasp mimics. They are daytime flyers. Uh, which can actually be a little bit startling if you're working with some of the pheromone uh, that attracts those males. The males will kind of hover around you as if it's a little wasp flying around. Um, and if you don't know what's going on, it's can, it can be like, oh, wow, something's, <laughs> someone's flying right by my face. Um, but these moths, um, they can't do anything. They can't bite. They can't sting. They're, they're harmless. However, um, it's their larvae that are really causing the problems. So the larvae, or sorry, the, the females will lay their eggs at the base of the trunk of a peach tree, um, or actually uh, most of our home fruits in general, or sorry, sorry, stone fruits in general. So cherries, plums, et cetera, they can attack those as well. So the eggs are laid near the, the trunk, the eggs hatch and they burrow into the tree and feed at the, the larger roots at the base uh, near near the, near the soil surface. So here's some of the larvae here feeding on, on those roots. And you can see they're 
quite large compared to the roots that they're feeding on. And so that damage can really cause those trees to lose vigor and productivity. And eventually it can lead to the whole tree dying because if you have enough of these uh, larvae feeding on the roots, you lose all the nu nutrients that are going up into the tree, uh, effectively girdling uh, the tree and eventually killing it. Thankfully, there's only one generation per year, uh, but the, still the damage that can be done within the year is substantial. Lesser Petri boar, actually the males and the females both look very similar and they actually look quite similar to the male Petri boar. However, they're a little bit smaller. The Petri boars are, have like a wingspan about of an inch and a half, whereas the lesser Petri boar is a little bit smaller. They have about a quarter or sorry, three quarters of an inch to about an inch and a quarter. So just, just slightly smaller, uh, but they have a very similar look with that black with the, the, yellow, the yellow lines there. Uh, just so like the, the Petri boar, they're both native to North America. And again, the larva are the ones that are causing that damage. However, in this case, instead of attacking the roots, they're actually attacking the trunk and the scaffolding limbs. And the biggest issue here is that um, the, the Petri boar is able to lay its eggs just on the, the soil surface and the larvae hatch and they can, they can burrow into the tree there. Lesser Petri boar, the eggs are not sticky, so they can't just lay their eggs on the trunk. They can't lay it on those scaffolding limbs because if they do, they'll just basically fall off or get blown off in the wind. So they need wounds in order for uh, the, legs, the eggs to actually get laid on the tree. So those wounds can be from um, cold injury where the bark starts to crack. They can stick their, the eggs right in those cracks, and then they're stuck. The eggs can hatch, and then they can burrow into the tree. Or if there's a mechanical injury from like a mower or something like that that breaks that bark, uh, then the eggs can be laid right there as well. And anytime the, the tree is injured like that, it gives off volatiles. Those volatiles can attract in the females and they'll seek out those damaged trees and find that damage to lay her eggs. Um, so young trees generally are, are less uh, attacked by uh, lesser Petri borer because generally those, those younger trees have fewer fewer injuries. Um, but as the age, as the trees age, they tend to get more issues with uh, uh, freeze damage or machine damage and, or, or even um, damage due to pruning. And so as the tree ages, they're more susceptible to lesser peat tree bore due to those, those, uh, those wounds. Like I mentioned, they feed on uh, the trunk and the scaffolding limbs. Uh, and because they're feeding on those limbs, they're basically cutting off the, the circulation of the tree from the, the roots to the new growth and also where the fruit is being produced. So you're losing that vigor and also production as well. And because they're feeding on that limbs, if you look at this damage here, that's going to significantly reduce um, the support of those limbs. Eventually the, the limbs can break um, or, or just eventually die. And because you're opening up the tree um, at these wounds, you're also allowing other pests and pathogens to get into those trees. Unlike uh, the Petri boar, the lesser Petri boar can have two generations per year. And if it's a really warm season, actually three. And what we're seeing in the Southeast is potentially four generations per year. So this is a, a can be pretty devastating if we're not getting the, the management under control. All right, just to show a little bit more uh, kind of closer images here, Look um, at the base of the tree here is where we have that peach tree bore damage. This is all this uh, gumming and frass, which I'll talk a little bit about in a second here. Um, you can see all that piling up right at the base, and that's basically being pushed out of the wound as the larvae are feeding. And similar here over the lesser peach tree bore on the scaffolding limbs, we get all this gumming and frass um, on, on those branches there. All right, so in the past, chemical control has been really kind of our primary way of managing um, the, the Petri bore and lesser Petri bore, but it's really never been that great because once the borers are in the tree, the chemicals are basically ineffective. We're unable to get the, the, or penetrate the tree to get to the, to, to the larvae that are inside the tree there. And a lot of our cover sprays they will kill the adults. So things like pyrethroids and even neonicotinoids can kill the adults, but the adults are very good flyers. And even though they are daytime flyers and will, will be hanging out within the orchards to mate and lay their eggs, they also often spend time 
in the surrounding landscape and, and in some of the forested areas around the orchard. So they're not necessarily going to be in the orchard where you're targeting those sprays. So you definitely will kill some of the adults, but you're not going to get them all. And one of the best ways that we had in the past was using post-harvest trunk sprays. So applying the insecticide like chlorpyrifos directly to those trunks where the attacks are generally occurring. Um, but with the loss of chlor chlorpyrifos or lores ban, uh, we're losing one of the, the main chemistries for this. And so we're not really sure yet what we have to replace that. So that brings us to mating disruption. So we're basically stopping these insects from mating. If you stop them from mating, they can't produce the eggs. No eggs, no larvae, no larvae, hopefully no damage, right? So let's see how that works. So the real, just kind of a basic idea of mating disruption. Here we have our, our female lesser peach tree boar hanging out on a, on a nice, lovely peach tree, waiting for a male to come by. However, if you're in a giant orchard, if you're a female moth, waiting for a ma male can be really hard. They're like, they're tiny little insects waiting for another tiny little insect to find that, lar that, that moth. So to help them find that, they're going to use pheromone. That pheromone plume basically creates a nice little um, map or a, a, a easy way for those males to find the female. So a male comes along, he's looking for a female, right? He finds that plume and he can basically follow that just like a little walkway in the air, of course, and almost pinpoint accuracy, find those females, they mate. And unfortunately that mating results in larvae, right? So lesser petri boar, each female can produce about 400 eggs in her lifetime. The petri boar can produce about 500 eggs in her lifetime. So that mating can easily result in a lot of damage, All right? However, if we use mating disruption, we still have that female, but we now add in a little twist tie that's filled with a synthetic pheromone. It's actually, these twist ties have both the pheromone for the lesser petri boar and petri boar. So we put those out in those orchards. Uh, the female still producing her, her pheromone. However, we put these dispensers throughout the orchard. So they basically creates this big, giant cloud of pheromone now that male comes along he's trying to follow that cloud to find the female but basically can't right there's so many of these dispensers out there that he can't figure out the difference between a dispenser and a female or he basically just gets so overwhelmed with all the pheromone out in that orchard that he basically gives up and that results in no larvae because there's no mating uh, so that's what we want to find out right so mating disruption for boars is actually not new. It's been around for, for decades, actually. Uh, some of the early tests were done in Georgia in the 1970s, uh, but more, more relevant to the New York, some work has been done um, in the 1990s in Virginia and Pennsylvania, looking at lesser petri boar, uh, comparing this mating disruption versus the insecticide, which was uh, chlorpyrifos. And so what they found here, if we look at our black bars, which are the chemical or lores ban application compared to the mating disruption, which are the white bars, we see that looking at three generations of uh, the, the lesser petri boar, that there's a little bit differences between the different generations, but overall, the mating disruption had fewer uh, infestations compared to the chemical control. Uh, these are not statistically significant, but the real takeaway is that yeah, it, it numerically we're seeing less less injury uh, than the chemical, and if not, it's at least working just as well as the chemical chemical control. So mating disruption is working very well in Virginia. Looking at the Pennsylvania da uh, data, very similar as well. We have this a, a different here um, before the treatment, showing that the orchards that they were comparing uh, with the chemical versus mating disruption before they did this study, uh, they were basically equal. And so we're not starting out with very little damage compared to a lot of damage. It's pretty much the same. But when we look at that over time, looking at those three different generations, uh, like with, with um, Virginia, we're seeing that there's a little bit differences over time. There's not all the same, but overall, the, the mating disruption is working as well, if not better, than the lower span application. So looking at just a little bit of data from uh, more recent work back in 2015 in Virginia, this is coming out of Dan Frank's lab, uh, very similar as what we saw before. It's, it's a little bit um, more confusing here. Uh, we're still looking at the infested trees 
And here we have um, in the, the gray bars, the insecticide, which is Lors band versus our mating disruption. And the bars are a little bit closer throughout. There's no significant difference. That's what those A's, all the A's are saying. Everything is basically the same, but that's okay in this situation. We're saying that, yeah, mating disruption works just as well, if not better than Lors band. So now that Lors band is gone, mating disruption is, is an equal, if not better replacement. So now that it's 2023, what can mating disruption really provide to our peach production here in the, the east? Well, we have um, pretty much one option right now. There are, are some other uh, companies working on mating disruption for boars, but uh, the one that we have right now is called Isomate PTB Dual. It's produced by uh, Pacific Biocontrol, uh, which is the distributor out west, but on the east, uh, it's uh, CBC America. So if you see though either one of those, they're both the same. Um, it's just one's West Coast, one's East Coast, All right? But this isomate PTB dual, that dual means it works for both peach tree bore and lesser peach tree bore. And when you put these out at 150 dispensers per acre, uh, so depending on your density, this could be about one per tree or one or two per tree, depending on how, how, how dense it is. But putting them on basically every tree in the orchard creates that big cloud to help help stop the males from finding the females. Deploy these prior to moth emergence in the spring. Um, so that's usually just prior to bloom. Uh, put those out there and then they work all season long. You wanna place them on the lateral branches about mid height in the canopy. Uh, so you don't wanna put them too low or too high, but about mid range. I usually put them out about eye level, but I'm only five seven, so I'm pretty short. So just uh, keep a note that you don't wanna put them too high. All right, but what's really nice is you put those out once that season and it works all season long. You don't have to worry about coming out and reapplying them or applying um, them multiple times a season. But however, they only work one season. So you have to come back each season to apply those, but it is season long um, of, uh, efficacy there. As with everything, there are a few caveats, right? So it works well, but there are some issues that we do have to address. So the first one is that area application is, is needed to get true efficacy of using mating disruption. So just an example here, we have uh, two peach orchards. If one, we apply that mating disruption. So up here, we put out those 150 dispensers per acre, but the neighboring orchard down here, we don't put any mating disruption. So the males can find the females down here. Those mated females, they're most likely gonna lay their eggs in that same orchard but they are just, just as likely to move to that uh, mating disrupted orchard and lay, their, her, lay her eggs there as well. And so she can fly up there, you know, it's just a, a, a few hundred yards, lay her eggs. And so spend all that time and money putting the, the disruption up here, and you're still gonna get damage. So really what you need to do is have both of these orchards under mating disruption in order to get those unmated females She's, she can fly around, she can do whatever she wants, but she doesn't have eggs to deposit. Uh, so you're not gonna have any damage in either of those orchards. So what it comes down to is that any orchard that's within about a half a mile to a mile apart need to be under disruption. And that can be problems if, if you have neighbors who are also growing peaches, you need to really work with them to make sure that all of those adjacent orchards are gonna be under disruption. Another caveat is that orchards with strong slopes. So if you're growing peaches in the mountains, um, you're not gonna get an uh, even pheromone distrib distribution because the pheromone is heavier than air. So here's an example here. If we have um, our, our, our pheromone out there, it's going to actually pool down in the lower, just like, just like with cold air um, and, uh, and stuff like that. It's not going to evenly be distributed throughout that orchard. So you're going to get a gradient of that pheromone. So any 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 trees that are down here at the bottom, it's going to be great uh, pheromone protection there. However, as you move up that hill, you're just not going to have the same amount of pheromone, which is going to likely break down and allow females and males to mate. So this does work best on flat terrain. However, I have seen it work in the mountains. I work with growers in uh, the uh, in the upstate of South Carolina. They're quite hilly, um, and they actually work really well up there as well. Uh, but it is one thing; it has broken down in other areas. 
but um, I have seen it work work well in some in some places. But just note that if you're on a hilly area, just know that it, it might not work best for you. Just in a very similar manner here, gaps in trees will also decrease the pheromone distribution. If you have orchards where you have a lot of trees that have died, and this is incredibly common in Georgia, uh, we get um, armillary root rot, and so trees just die year after year after year. We lose these trees and creates big open spaces in our orchard. So an orchard like this on the left here, we're not going to get good distribution of that pheromone. So any of these big pockets here where there's no pheromone, the males and the females can find each other there. And if they're mating in this, this little hole here, a female will then just fly over here and lay her eggs. Whereas in the right here where we had this nice, consistent uh, tree density here, if you have pheromone all throughout that orchard, you're going to get good uh, mating disruption. So in that case, really, if you have that uneven pheromone the distribution, it could lead to mating disruption breaking down. And if it breaks down, you're going to lead to uh, mating. That mating leads to the eggs. The eggs lead to larvae, et cetera, et cetera. So you're going to see damage occur. And the last caveat here is that, um, especially if you have uh, orchards that have had high pressure from year to year, you might also need to apply insecticides that first year that you uh, incorporate mating disruption. So that first year, I wouldn't just go, go cold turkey, especially in these high pressure orchards. You want to incorporate insecticides and mating disruption. And, and the reason really behind that is that if you have low pressure, you still get it where the, the, the males have a hard time finding those females. But in an orchard where you have a lot of females, all producing those plumes on different trees, you add in more males, you still get a few males that might not be able to find those females, but all it takes is uh, one male to find that female and mate. And once it mate, she can lay up to, at least with lesser, 400 eggs, with a, the greater 500 eggs, and then leading to, to larvae and causing problems there. All right, so in order to make sure that mating disruption is working, there are a couple of things we can do, all right? So I, I don't suggest ever just putting mating disruption out, putting those dispensers out and say, all right, we're good and call it a day. I really recommend going out and doing some monitoring. So we can monitor for the adults. So looking for those moths, we can use pheromone baited traps. So we can easily buy the just little, little septum. You hang them in these traps. You put a sticky card in the bottom of these traps. So these are uh, just generally known as delta traps. The moths will then fly in here looking for that pheromone and get stuck on the bottom card. They put these out about one trap per 10 acres. You have a trap for a petri boar and a separate trap for lesser petri boar. You can use these to monitor for those adults. So the idea here is that if you have these pheromone beta traps, if, if the mating disruption is working, if you have enough pheromone ties out there, if the males can't find these traps, then theoretically, they also can't find the females. And so we call that trap shutdown. So if we get traps that don't have any, any adults on there, then I, I theoretically, that our mating disruption is working. And so here, we are getting a, a quite a few uh, adult lesser petri boar moths on these cards. And so the mating disruption is probably not working. Um, and just to, to, to be fair, this is actually from a control site where we did not have mating disruption. So we're catching moths uh, and we're supposed to be. Uh, unfortunately, though, just because you don't catch any moths doesn't mean that there isn't a few moths out there mating just by chance. Um, oh, sorry, I'm skipping ahead. This is just some, some data showing the petri boar using the moths over time. This is down in Georgia uh, from a couple of years ago. And these unmated disruption, we're getting moths almost all season long. Whereas we compare that to our mating disruption or the isomate. Uh, we're getting no moths in those traps. Similar with a lesser petri boar, we're getting those moths throughout the season, but looking at the uh, mating disruption, it's zero throughout. Uh, but what I had, was starting to talk about is that just because you, you, you don't catch any moths doesn't mean that some of them might not be mating and, and causing some problems. Uh, so we also want to make sure we're looking for that injury. So we can monitor the trees for the damage. Uh, I won't go out and look at every tree in your orchard, um, but scout around looking for some of that, uh, some of that frass and that gumming. So for the petri boar again, we're going to be looking at the base of the tree. 
So looking for that, that disgusting, ooey, gooey mess that's filled with frass. Frass is just the, the caterpillar poop that's being pushed out of the galleries from those trees. Um, it's, it's really gritty and gross. But if you see those at the base of the trees, um, especially if you're using mating disruption, it's probably meaning you're, you're having some attacks and, and your mating disruption is breaking down. You can also look for exuvia stuck in the gumming. So that gum will stay there for actually can, can be for several years. Um, and so look for these exuvia, which is basically just the pupil case. So once that larvae pupates, it creates this basically a shell. As it then um, emerges from that shell as an adult, that shell stays behind and is often stuck in that, that gum. And so you can come out uh, within the, the springtime, especially uh, for peach tree borer. And if you find those, that means there's been active attacks and there's been active adults emerging, uh, which then shows that the, the, the management is not working. For lesser peach tree borer, you're going to be looking at those scaffold limbs. Again, we're looking for that gumming. So we have all this gum that's mixed with the frass. They also will leave behind an exuvia or a pupil case here. Uh, here on this, on the left side, you can see there's quite a few attacks on this tree. This is an unmanaged tree. It was really beaten up by lesser peach tree borer. But note that not all gumming is going to be borer damage. Uh, peaches are are delicate. The fruit itself is incredibly delicate, but the trees are also very delicate. They they will gum uh, for a variety of reasons. I feel like sometimes if I look at it wrong, it decides that, oh, I'm going to produce some gum here. Uh, but also there's gummosis, there's fungal gummosis, uh, some small you know, mechanical or machine type injury will cause them the gum. But the non bore ones are going to be this nice uh, kind of clear. It will uh, get brown over time, uh, but it's pretty smooth. If you squeeze it in your hands, it's sticky, but it's smooth. If you look at the bore damage, it's usually dark brown, and it's also very gritty. It's filled with that frass. Um, it's pretty gross if you want to take it and squeeze it, but that's really a good way of identifying if it's got that grit. You can feel it really well. Um, you can also see it if you, if you don't want to touch it. But um, there it is. It's, it's, these, it just looks like it's filled with sawdust, and that's that, that frass. And so that's a very good uh, characteristic. So if you see a lot of gumming, don't worry. Go up and look at it to make sure it actually has that frass. All right, just to show there is a comparison um, from 2021, we were looking at the adults in those traps, but we also looked at the damage and the isomate uh, was again, not statistically significant, but we're still seeing a reduction and it's working just as well as that lower span. All right, so if we are seeing that damage, we are seeing moths in those traps, it's probably worth going back and adding some insecticides. I know that I said the cover sprays and trunk sprays aren't the best, and we don't necessarily have a good chemical right now for those trunk sprays, um, but it's worth talking with the extension agents or specialists in the area, figure out what we, what we can do to help stop some of that damage occurring. Um, so look at those local management recommendations if, if we have chemistries that will help you. All right, so this summarizing uh, all, all I said in this uh, kind of fire hose about uh, mating disruption borers, the mating disruption that we had that isomate uh, PTB dual, again, is going to work for both lesser peach tree borer and peach tree borer. And at applying it once a season lasts all season long. Those pheromone uh, will continue uh, to stop the males from finding the females. Um, and even though the data is not always statistically significant, what we're seeing is that this is working just as well, if not better, than chlorpyrifos. And, and I didn't show it in this, but using maiden disruption over consecutive years actually works better and better and better. We're seeing a reduction in those moths year after year after year. And so it's, it's a, it's, it can be a long-term process, but within a few years, you're really, really reducing the number of moths in that area. And also, just by, by switching to maiden disruption, we're reducing the overall insecticide input, which is good for beneficial insects. You know, we, this is great for pollinators. And so that's one big concern uh, for many growers and for, for consumers. We don't want to be hurting pollinators. But it's also good for our natural enemies. Uh, that's one thing we are seeing in the southeast is that we're killing a lot of our, our uh, lady beetles and parasitic wasps that would be feeding on other insects like San Jose scale. 
So if we're killing them with these broad spectrum insecticides, we're not getting the natural control of scale that we would normally get. So by reducing our insecticide use, we're actually seeing some of those beneficial insects repopulate the orchards. But again, there's also going to be some issues. This pheromone is pest specific, so it only works for lesser petri boar and petri boar, which is great. We're getting both of them, but that still means we can have problems with plump perculio, with stink bugs, oriental fruit moth, uh, which also has mating disruption. But uh, this one dispenser only works for two out of our, our, our multitude of pests. The area-wide approach is most effective. Um, so if you if you have neighbors that uh, are adjacent to your orchards that also are growing peaches or, or cherries or plums, you need to make sure that all those trees are under disruption. And as of now, though, the product cost is still relatively expensive compared to some of our, our broad spectrum insecticides. Uh, but over the years, I think it really does pay for itself. It really reduces the amount of damage. All right, so quickly, um, well, I still have a, a few more minutes. I want to talk about entomopathogenic nematodes. Um, this is something that I've been working on with uh, David Shapiro Alon at the USDA in Georgia. Uh, so these are beneficial nematodes. I know there's a lot of issues with plant parasitic nematodes that can cause problems for our peaches, but these are the beneficial nematodes. They do not harm peach trees or any trees at all. They're really specific to insects. And for the case of borers, there's two uh, commercially available uh, suppliers for a specific species. This is Steiner Nema carpocapsi. Uh, we have BASF, which is Nemesis C, and BioB, which is uh, BioSC. Uh, so that SC stands for Steiner Nema carpocapsi. Um, both of these companies uh, produce very effective materials. Uh, they're highly regarded. You can get other ones from third party. Um, I've actually bought some from Arbico Organics. They work just as well, um, but these are commercially available uh, for, for large scale applications. And what's great about these entomopathogenic nem nematodes, they can be applied using the standard equipment. Um, so this is actually uh, the, the, the same sprayer that they would use for Lohr's band doing the trunk applications. They're using that to apply these nematodes uh, in a water solution at the base of the trees to attack uh, peach tree borer. And just to quickly to show you what's going on here, um, because this is all new to me as well. I'm an insect guy. I'm not a, a nematode guy. But what you do is you, you're buying these nematodes and they come as what they're called infective juveniles. These infective juveniles are the ones that actually attack the host. So you spray these on the trees. They will then seek out the larvae of peach tree borer. Once they find that larvae, they'll enter the host. They release a bacteria that helps kill the host. They then feed on the host from the inside. As they mature, they become adults. They then mate uh, as the insect dies. After they reproduce inside the host, the new infected juveniles then burst out of that host. And we can see here in this, this, lot, this real image here, all these little infected juveniles just bursted out of, uh, of that larvae there. In real life, it's pretty disgusting. They actually get masses of millions of them. This is almost a white um, uh, cloud, but it's it might be gross to look at, but it's incredibly effective at killing bugs. All right, so then those infected juveniles are going to move on and, and find a new host and repeat that whole cycle on and on. So what we can do is just like we did with chlorpyrifos, apply that in the fall at a rate of about half a million to a million of these nematodes per tree. That sounds like an insane amount, but really a million of those can fit in basically a smaller than a teaspoon. Um, you add that your spray tank, you apply it to the trees and kill those, those larvae. So doing that, um, approximately September after post-harvest, you can use a handgun, a trunk sprayer, boom sprayer, um, any, basically any kind of uh, sprayer that you have, but note that you need to remove any sort of fine screens that you have. Those screens um, to a, a nematode are basically like razor wire. So you spray those nematodes through that screen and they just explode and those infective juveniles um, are no longer um, effective, all right? Um, and just to show that they work really well, this is a comparison from a few years ago uh, using the control, which is chlorpyrifos here, compared to that entomopathogenic nematode. You're getting exactly zero infestation compared to uh, almost 40% infestation with the, the chlorpyrifos. So it works incredibly well. Uh, 
and what's awesome about this is that it can work not only as a preventative, so you can apply them to the trees, and then once those uh, the uh, petri borer lay their eggs, if the nematodes are there, they will attack the larvae as they hatch, or they can be applied as a curative. So if you see a wound, and especially in a, an active wound that has that frass in there, you can apply uh, these nematodes to those wounds, and they will seek out the larvae inside the trees. Um, and this is an example showing that uh, with the different types of applications. They had a boom sprayer, a handgun, a special trunk sprayer, and then just a watering can applied uh, to those trunks. And all four of those applications worked better than our control and worked just as well as for pure foss. Uh, so it doesn't matter how you apply them, it can kill those larvae. But just like with mating disruption, there's always going to be a caveat. Um, moisture is key. Uh, if you have um, irrigation, that is ideal. You need to keep that soil moist because these are free living little, little roundworms that if, uh, if they desiccate, they die. Um, and so if you don't have any soil on those or moisture on that soil, they, they, they will die within a few weeks. Uh, but if you have irrigation that can keep that, uh, keep that soil moist, it will help keep those, those, those nematodes alive for several weeks longer. You can also use uh, a special fire gel here. This test is called Barricade 2. You apply it at a 1 to 2% rate, mixing it in with that those nematodes. And here what we saw with the nematodes with no irrigation and no barricade, uh, we still saw a lot of infestation, a lot of damage. But what, And that no irrigation plus the barricade gel, it allowed those nematodes to live longer. And actually, we saw a significant uh, reduction in the, the damage, just as we saw with the chlorpyrifos. So it can work um, without irrigation, but it does add that extra step. All right, quick summary. This, this works really, really well for Petri bore and works in, in cases better than chlorpyrifos. However, right now it doesn't work as well for lesser Petri bore because lesser Petri bore are on the scaffolding limbs. And so it's hard to keep those nematodes moist enough to be alive long enough to actually seek out the larvae. And we are working on this, to try to figure out how to make this better. But right now, the lesser Petri bore is really not as effective as Petri bore. It's quite economical because you're really just spraying around the border. We're getting it down to about uh, 5 to $7 per acre with the nematodes. Um, but again, it does require that moist soil. So if you don't have irrigation, it does involve a couple more steps. All right, and I'm running out of time, but I really want to just show one more thing, which you've probably already heard of, but I'm going to uh, talk about it a little bit more just in case you haven't, which is the My IPM smartphone app. This is a free app. Uh, you can download from the, the, the app store, either Apple or, or Android, and it's designed to be a supplement uh, to your regional uh, management guide, and it features a lot of different cool things, like it has a variety of crops. If you scroll down here on the app, there's actually peach down here. Uh, but we also have apple and cherry and blueberry and grapes. There's diagnostic tools so we can look to see what these pests actually look like as adults, as larvae, some of the trapping methods that we have. There's also the, I think the most important part is these interactive tables that have the different labeled active ingredients and trade names for each of the pests. So I'm showing oriental fruit moth here because uh, there's not very many for, for Petri bore, but there's a, it shows a whole list of active ingredients that are labeled. It has the, the pre-harvest intervals and also the re-entry intervals. It also has efficacy to say which of these are gonna be more effective than the others. And um, also we have our chemical control, again, we, our active ingredients and trade names, but also has a whole uh, list of non-chemical control. So in this case, it'd be mating disruption and uh, entomopathogenic nematodes. Goes over the pest biology, so you can learn a little bit more, more about that. But also a new thing we're doing is resistant management tools. So we rotation and stuff like that and pesticide risk. These are, these are um, parts that are still in, in work. Um, they're not quite all updated yet, uh, but you'll be able to look at the app and look at these active ingredients to see which ones are more, uh, more safe for pollinators, which ones are more safe for people and stuff like that. Uh, so eventually it's gonna be, it's gonna be really awesome. Uh, but what's great about it is continually updated. We have seven different uh, land grant universities, including Cornell, um, that are working on this. So it's, you know, there's, there's still issues with the app, I will admit, but 
every year. Uh, it's getting better and better. Um, so you, it's free. You can use it um, anytime as long as you download it to your phone. Uh, you can go to bugwood.org and find the app there um, or search for it in the Apple Store or Google Play Store. Or if you want to the scan that QR code, you are more than welcome. It'll take you right there. And that is all I have. All right, great, thank you. Um, that was really interesting. I appreciate the entomopathogenic nematode stuff too. I wasn't even expecting that. So great bonus. We have just a couple minutes for questions and a few of them did already come into the chat. So I'm gonna start oh. with those. Uh, one question was about the use of surround, I guess for bore management, if that's practical, if it's labeled, et cetera. It's so surround is, um, because of the being kale, kale and clay, the, the label isn't necessarily important uh, for bores. However, it's not going to work that well. Um, it, it might deter some of the, the larvae from boring into uh, the trunks, um, but at the rate that you have to apply it, it it's not going to do that much. Um, now, what would be interesting is, this is something I've never done, is apply it over and over and over uh, to make sure that you have a real nice thick layer um, that might work. Um, but the, the larvae, is, if they can find any any sort of little crevice that's not protected, they'll crawl in. And that's why they, the insecticides work, because if you get that complete coverage, if they get a little bit of contact, that will kill them. But the, the, the kale and clay, um, if any of it washes off and, and, and allows a little bit of exposed area, then, it, then it's not going to work. Okay. And there was a question also about um, whether the mating disruption works with dogwood borer. It was sort of answered in the chat that there's a different product. Yes, that's exactly there. right. There is uh, there is another product specific for dogwood borer. And then I also wanted to follow up on that and ask if you have any idea if those um, if that same entomopathogenic nematode would cross over and work for dogwood borer. Yes. And that's, that's one cool thing. There's, there's a whole, whole variety of species and, and there's a bunch that are still commercially available, but that Steiner Nema carpal capsi uh, works for a lot of our boring insects. Um, so I've used it on, on grape root borer as well. And it's highly effective against that. Um, I personally don't know uh, uh, for dogwood borer, but I would expect that it would work. Um, it just, it works very well against those uh, lepidopteran pests, those those um, those moth pests. Cool. And um, is Movento effective on any of these borers? Unfortunately, no. I know Movento is a, a great systemic insecticide, and it, in in my mind is like, yeah, of course that's going to work. They're they're feeding on the inside of the tree where that insecticide is, but unfortunately, it just does not work. Um, it's really Movento works much better on the hemipteran pests like, like San Jose scale and some aphids, but for our lepidopteran pests like the moths, uh, it, it does not. And then one final question to kind of tie together to the two sections of your talk. Um, somebody says that they've used mating disruption for many years. It's working pretty well for them. Is there any benefit to swip, switching over to the nematodes if mating disruption seems like it's working? Personally, I would say no. Um, if it, if mating disruption is working for you, I would I would continue with that because it it personally I think it is the best option. Uh, what I would what I would like to recommend to my growers is that the, the use of those nematodes is great if you see any breakdown of the mating disruption. If you see some of those wounds, you can go out with a backpack sprayer and spray those specific wounds and help uh, keep that under control. And so I use the nematodes as more of a supplemental tool to mating disruption in situations where it might break down. All right, perfect. Well, thank you so much, Brett. I really appreciate your time. Very, very interesting talk. Well, thanks. Thanks so much for having me. And thank, thank you all for listening.